acá del CMM, eh, la charla va a dar Gonzalo Mera, que es un estudiante de doctorado en Colombia, que nos va a hablar de intersección entre estas dos cosas, eh, transporte óptimo y sus aplicaciones a datos. No sé si, de hecho, Felipe, no sé si la te la hacen en inglés o si sí, hay gente acá que no habla español. Sí, sí, sí. eh, no, 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 Hello to everyone. So, uh, I'm Gonzalo Mena. I was a student here in the Department of Mathematical Engineering. Now I am a student at Columbia University in the Department of Statistics. As so far during the PhD, I've been focused mostly on applied problems and data, how to like come up with algorithms to analyze data. And um, it turned out that, like recently, I like uh, uh, because I was working in a project, I I, I became aware about, about like what was going on in the field of optimal transportation and how optimal transportation was very being very useful to tackle problems in data science to uh, to come up with new ways of analyzing data and also in even in, in machine learning like in, in people are like, working with algorithms and focusing more in the computational aspects, like computer scientists. Uh, it was like like being able like, to, to use the theories from optimal transportation uh, was very, being very fruitful. Um, actually, like uh, I was in a conference recently uh, on machine learning, and there was like a, a workshop on that, and I, I, I saw that there, there's like a, a lot of interest there, and actually like uh, there's a book. So what I'm going to talk here is about like the theory of optimal transportation and also like in the computational aspects, which is more related to uh, data science and machine learning. Uh, and, and the main re reference there are like the Cedric Villani book uh, on optimal transportation, which is like the, about the theory. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the main theorems there because like everything that we, we do there uh, relies on those theorems. And then I'm going to talk about like uh, like some some things that are uh, in this new book uh, that is is available online for free, and it's related to, to how to use those theorems in order to come up with algorithms and analyze data and do interesting things. Uh, and also, like I'm going to talk about like some relevant research that has been going on in uh, in, in the past five years. Um, I think like uh, the overall goal of doing this talk is like to to be able to reach out to the community of like people that work more in the theory and, and to show that there are like interesting things going on in the side of data analysis and machine learning and, and that is like really new questions that need to be analyzed using theory and for that uh, people working in like in probability on the learning theory or optimization are like have like uh, a lot of new questions to address um, and also uh, to show like what are the, the applications. So, so we have like a, this like in, in, in statistics, like the, what we learn in the first like class or in the first course is like, there's like this framework, which is the maximum likelihood framework, right? Which gives us a recipe for estimating a model or finding a, a, the best model given the data. Um, this was like proposed by Fisher, uh, like almost 100 years ago. And it has like a, a nice interpretation because like in, in terms of data, uh, we can, uh, I mean, like by find, finding the maximum likelihood estimator uh, boils down to uh, finding the, the configuration of parameters that best explain the data that we observe. So like this is like a very comfortable uh, interpretation and, and if we like uh, work in this framework, like we, we have like a lot of concepts that are very relevant and people have been working on that for the past 100 of years. Uh, we have the concept of sufficiency, efficiency, like what is the variance, and we have like an asymptotic theory and so on. <coughs> um, and also like um, something to, to have in mind here is that we can think about like the, the doing maximum, less, maximum likelihood estimation as minimizing a discrepancy between uh, our model and the true distribution, uh, but it, because the, we don't have access to the true distribution, we have only like a, the, the empirical distribution. So basically, we have like a, an empirical uh, version of a divergence between our model and and the true uh, be, between the model that we propose and the true distribution, 
which in the limit becomes, becomes a divergence. So with, by, what I want to say is that by doing maximum length estimate estimation, we are like basically trying to minimize a divergence between uh, uh, like the true distribution and um, and our model. And the, um, the question is like, uh, is this is enough? I mean, I, I, is this enough having this framework? Maybe that there are other ways to other like discrepancies that we could, we could study and maybe that is going to lead to better like properties in some sense. And it turns out that like recently that like, people have been like because probably because like we have like, a lot of data and and we are like faced with new regimes that we were not faced in the past. Is that like in some cases like doing maximum value for estimation is not giving like the best answers and people have begun to study like other kinds of ways of measuring discrepancy between measure so that uh, you can get a better, um, a better um, ways to analyze data or, or have better geometries and so on. And, and that's why like, this is the motivation to introduce like, a, a new kind of uh, discrepancy and, and see what, how far can we go with that kind of discrepancy. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm going to talk about optimal transport. And this is like, usually when people uh, talk about optimal transport, they talk about like, this example of, yeah, you have like resources in mines and you want to transport them to factories, right? And there is a cost, uh, so you have like a certain kind of uh, amount uh, of resources in, in the mines, right? And that has to be the same kind of, uh, the same amount of resources that you're going to transport, you, so you have like a, a, an equality there. Um, and you want to like to do this efficiently, so you want to minimize the cost of transporting like, all the units in the, all the resources in the, in the mines to all the factories. And this is like a, just a linear program, and um, like this is like a, the way people uh, have been uh, first introduced the optimal transportation problem. But of course, like mathematicians, like because of different reasons, like wanted to like to go into more abstract setup and then. Uh, uh, you end up like having like a, a more uh, a solid foundation of what the problem means and how you're going to address it. Uh, so like the now this, there are like two standard formulations to this problem. Uh, one of them is the Munch formulation and the other is the Kantorovich formulation. Uh, so the Munch formulation is like you have like two measures uh, that you want to and you want to like basically make one of the measures become the other measure. So you're going to try to, each point going to move it to uh, another position. Uh, and that means that you have like a, a, a function that moves points in the domain X to the domain Y. <coughs> uh, you want to minimize like the cost of doing this. So every time you, you move X to a certain point, you have a cost and you, have, you want to minimize this integrated cost. And you need to have a, a condition that, that says like, a, uh, basically like a, a mass balance condition so that that is stable in terms of like this push forward condition uh, which means that the measure b or nu uh, has to be the push forward of, of u of mu and it turns out that like this much formulation uh, is fine but the problem is that in many cases there is not going to be even a solution for this problem so people uh, uh, mostly like uh, the guys the person that started doing this was Kantorovich, and uh, he won a Nobel Prize uh, for working this study <coughs> along with other people. Uh, they consider a, a relaxation of this problem. So instead of like moving one point to an, a, a single position, you basically like each point, you move it like to a, a distribution over y. So that means like the, the, the relevant notion here is like to have a, a coupling, which is like a, a joint distribution uh, between x and y. And you, you need to like uh, to to enforce the condition that the marginals are fixed are, are given by mu and nu, and there the problem uh, reads uh, <coughs> minimizing the uh, a double integral in this time. Okay, so in some cases like this problem are going to to coincide, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to tell you a bit uh, about the theorems involved here. Uh, so there is like a nice property that is going to be very useful, uh, which is like the Cantorovich duality. So we're going to focus for a, for a moment in the, in the 
Tatorovich formulation for the problem. And this is the problem. We want to minimize or take the, the minimize the this value, the the transportation cost. And the Kantorovich uh, duality theorem says that there is another way, which is like working in the dual space of doing this, uh, which is given by taking the supremum of another operator, uh, which is defined over a set of like some functions that are called the potential functions <coughs> that are required to satisfy an inequality, which is this one. Uh, yeah, and the theorem says that in the case uh, that C, uh, the cost function is uh, continuous, lower semi-continuous, Sorry, uh, lower semi-continuous function, then we are going to have this equality, which is essentially saying that the strong duality holds. Okay. Um, so actually, like, if we, we were in the discrete formulation of the optimal transportation problem, this would be like some like uh, elementary uh, uh, duality principles for linear programming. Mm -hmm. But because uh, we are in general spaces of measures, is that we like in order to prove this theorem, we, we have to appeal to more uh, general tools. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what are those tools. Uh, <clears throat> so we need to define like in order to prove this theorem. I'm just going to tell you a little bit, uh, a little bit about how to prove this theorem, but I'm not going to go into details. Uh, so we need to define there's like a, a relevant uh, in complex analysis, uh, like a, a relevant function that arises. You can define whenever you have a complex function, which is the Legrand uh, Fencher transform. Uh, and it is defined on the topological dual uh, do, via this uh, assignment. And you have like a, a plot that tells you like what is going on here. It's like uh, it is uh, this tells you like, like you can relate <laughs> the dual and the original function uh, by taking like a, a, a tangent line over a. a over a certain point. And this comes like, for example, we have like the, the if we, we focus on a, on a point and the dual, then we're going to have like a relation between the, uh, this point and the derivative of the original function. Um, I mean, the, the, the relation is not very like uh, crisp, but it's still like there's like some geometry principle involved. Uh, and at the end, like uh, this uh, the transform is, is Used in, in or one way to use it is like prove uh, the a theorem. Uh, so we have like also like a, a, a theorem that links like the the optimization of uh, original functions, or, or, or the, the complex functions, and the optimization of dual uh, uh, like the transform of, of the original functions. And this is good given by the fencher rogafeller theorem. And this uh, says like taking the infimum of this sum is going to be take it equal to taking the supremum of uh, some function uh, of the uh, of the continuous. Okay, and there is an interpretation here, uh, like an intuitive interpretation of this principle, which is that uh, if you are like having this plot, like taking the, finding the point, so that the distance between the two plots is the minimum, uh, is the same problem as finding like the point at which if you take the parallel lines, the margin or the distance between both is going to be minimized. Okay, so at the end, um, we're going to go very quick. Uh, we uh, apply this principle be, uh, because we are working in a very general space, so uh, we need to be very careful and, and, and define, uh, and, and, and make sure that everything is, is, is well defined and uh, because we are not in Rn. So here we, uh, to prove this, this, uh, this theorem, we, we first start like, uh, we first assume that spaces are, are, are compact, which is not going to be uh, true in general. And then we, we can use that the topological dual uh, uh, is like a, is a uh, well-defined, uh, well-known space, it's a space of random measures, and then we can use the, the previous theorem to, to actually like Define the the functions, uh, some functions, the linear functions, and then find their duals and show like the, that fetch and Rockefeller theorem is going to give us like the, the equality in the case of the compact spaces. Then uh, one can also show that the the this uh, pi is mu and, and and nu, which is the space of John John uh, distribution, 
this compact and so there is an infimum and then you see like this infimum one can like use a truncation argument and, and extend the result to to spaces x and y which might not be compact okay so i mean this proof is like five pages long but I just wanted to tell you like uh, if you want to extend it you you need to uh, apply this more general theorem and uh, uh, and appeal to uh, more sophisticated facts or analysis. And things get more interesting even uh, when we work in, in a metric space, a Polish space, uh, which is, uh, we're going to assume that x is equal to y, and we are uh, going to assume that the cost function comes from a metric. So we have a notion of distance between points in the space, the, the space x. And we assume it lower semi-continuous. And again, we define that this infimum. And also, we can define like a, a norm, uh, like a Lipschitz norm, and on the function so that this is uh, finite. And here, we are going to show that um, this infimum is actually like a supremum over uh, the, <coughs> like, the function with respect to this difference of measures. So uh, this is like a, actually like a, just like a, a part, not a particular case, but this is like something that changes a little bit from the previous theorem. So in the previous theorem, we have uh, the supremum was over, uh, right, J was like the sum of integrals, and then we had like two potentials, phi and psi, Right, and we had the sum. And now we have a, a similar expression, but we change our spaces. And we have uh, that the integral is, uh, is only one potential. So we have only phi, and we don't have psi. And basically what, what, what the theorem uh, boils down to is to say that one of the potentials is equal to minus the other. And then all of this is sum, right? So uh, again, like very brief sketch of the proof, uh, people uh, to prove this, like define like the uh, C concave conjugate pair of functions for the original one in this way, which is like the the, the young uh, French conjugate. But instead of having the, the product, we are going to have a class function. So it changes a little bit. Uh, but there, like by defining this, like we get like a very interesting algebra. Uh, so and it turns out that like. One can show that instead of having like the potentials uh, phi and psi, one can just show the, uh, that we can just use the potentials uh, phi conjugate and, and the double conjugate. Uh, so that reduces the problem a little bit. And then doing more algebra, one can show actually like in, in, in this context, one has like one of the conjugates is equal to minus the, the other one. And at the end, like doing algebra, uh, one shows that uh, that actually like one can replace psi by negative the one of the of the potentials, and this is like one of the relevant things here is that by doing this we end up having a a way of uh, defining a, a norm on the space of measures, right? So uh, yeah, so in space of measure so that the integral of the distance uh, is finite with respect to mu. Then we, we can define like this deep sheet norm, uh, which is uh, it's going to give us, give us a notion of distance between measures. And also, we have the another relevant case, which is different from the previous one, because they, uh, the, the, the this is the case in which the cost function is equal to the square norm. So previously we had the case in which we have a distance. That distance could be could have been the the difference between x and y. <coughs> but if we have the, the square uh, of this, then we no longer have a a distance. Uh, so like we cannot we, we cannot apply the previous theorem, but still in this case we get a very interesting result. Uh, and this result is that actually, actually like in the in the case of the of the square uh, um, cost function, then the Monge and the Gartolovich problems are the same, give the same solution. Um, and this are given by this function, this, 
this assignment. So, uh, I mean, we, we need some regularity conditions with are going to be in this case that uh, mu and nu don't assign uh, the mass to small sets, which is just it's the same as saying that uh, they don't assign uh, mass to, to sets that have the effect measure zero. Um, so in this case, like the, the transportation or the joint distribution uh, is, is going to be actually like, uh, like for each x is going to be only it's going to be only a single y, so that um, we have mass, and this means that this we are like defining as the transportation, the mass transportation. Uh, so in this case, like mu is going to be the gradient of a, a convex function push for, forward nu, and so this is the t. This is going to be the much uh, plan. And also, this is like a, an important concept that appears here, which is uh, the, the concept of displacement interpolation. And it, it is a, so in order to, to define this concept, we need to, uh, to extend a little bit the, the original definition of the transportation plan. So before we highlight the transportation between mu and nu, and now we want, we want to extend this to, to something that is like time dependent between zero and one. And because of this, we can see <coughs> those functions that, uh, that depend on, 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 a, on a curve, right? Between, that is defined between zero and, and one. And we like, in order to link both problems, we need to, uh, to say that uh, they, they are consistent uh, if uh, the, the, the optimal uh, C sub T is going, is going at T, uh, at, at <coughs> time one is going to be, give, give us the solution of the original transportation problem. And one of way of enforcing this is assigning like the cost function is going to be the infimum of some uh, cost over like a, a time dependent curve. Uh, for example, if, if one defines like a, the, the cost of, of a curve in this way, uh, one like, which is like the RDF uh, of a curve, then we get like a, the, the usual square cost. And we get like a very interesting uh, theorem here, which is that uh, the solution to the time dependent problem is going to be given by this assignment. Uh, so if you, if you notice here, if you replace by t equal one, you get the original problem, which is the, the much the solution to the original uh, transportation problem. And we're going to get, in this time, uh, like a set of, uh, of measures, which are, which are going to be like the solution up, up, up to a certain point. And this is going to be very relevant because we, are, we have like this, uh, equation with this, this assignment which says that at a certain time t, uh, the measure that we are going to be get, getting is going to be an interpolation in some sense of the identity and the, the, the final one, which is nu, and this is given by the Magan displacement interpolation. Uh, and this is not, not the same as like the, the usual interpolation between or the linear interpolation between two measures. That linear interpolation between two measures would uh, is, is going to appear in, in, in the case of other cost functions, but in this case, we need to get something that is more uh, has a, like a, a different kind of geometry. Uh, and actually, like it has a geodesic geometry. So like I'm not an expert in in non-Euclidean geometry, but here like. We, we get like a, 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 an expression, we can prove that actually like the, the, the distance between nu and the solution at time t is given by t times this, the solution between nu and, and b. And that means that this is defining a geodesic, geodesic path of, uh, in the space of uh, probability measures uh, and don't end up with this uh, metric. And so this formula of interpolation is visualized here. So we, can, we want to interpolate between two distributions and we can like uh, show this what, what we get, right? Uh, so if we, we're just doing like the, the, the linear interpolation between 
new and new, then we won't, we wouldn't get this. So there's something very special in this case uh, that that especially we're going to look at a little bit uh, this a little bit about this in, in some minutes. Yeah, and I was say, saying that actually this like some geometric structure, but actually like this can be formalized and it, it, it happens like for for all the for many cases, not only for the case in the cost function with the quadratic cost function, but in many others. And so here we, we have the another fact. So we have like a, again like a policy space with a certain distance. And we define uh, this uh, TP, which is as always. And it turns out that if we define WP as the, the P F root, then we're going to have a metric on the on the space of distributions, uh, Borel distributions, with bound, bounded P moments. Okay, so actually, yeah, we have a metric here, and and what, what we were just saw is that in the in the, in the square case. In this metric, we have like a notion of geodesic uh, or the minimum distance pass between one measure and another, and that notion is given by the Macan interpolation of formulas. Okay, so that was like the the theory behind or the theorems that everyone that uh, is more in the applied side has to know uh, in order to, to do progress in in the computational side. Uh, so I'm going to, to focus now in this problem and in the computational aspect and then again we, we have the problem of minimizing the, the minimum of a certain expectation right with respect to joint distributions in the in, the, in this pi mu and, and nu and in, in practice like when we are uh, addressing the problem computationally we are going to be working with discrete measures um, because we are going to work basically with uh, in the problem of uh, data is going to be given by histograms or something that is empirical. So because whenever we have empirical things, we get like a discrete measure. And this is the reason because like, we are going to be focusing more in this case. Uh, because of that, the problem becomes um, a problem of a linear function, minimizing a, a linear function over a polytope. And the polytope here is going to be called the transportation polytope. Uh, and the Transportation polytope is basically if we want to enforce the uh, the condition over the coupling that uh, the, the the marginals are fixed and then given by mu and, and nu. So actually, like here we can we even forget a little bit about the points x and, and y because we only care about the cost of transporting between x and y. Uh, yeah, and at the end, in the, in the computational point of view, at the end, we are going to be dealing, dealing with, uh, with minimizing linear functions. And people know how to do this uh, for many, for a long time. Uh, and people have been working uh, in people that do combinatorial optimization, for example, know how to solve this problem. And like, um, people in, in the optimal transportation community, whenever they, First, whenever they wanted to address a problem that involves solving this uh, minimization over the transportation polytope, they, they appeal to combinatorial optimization solvers that were okay, but like uh, as like applications have growth and we have like higher dimensional data, it seems that it is no longer enough. Uh, so like the, the, the problem with this solver is that they, the complexity is this cubically with n in practice, like in the context that, that people work, and this seems to be like something that is not scales as the things that people need in practice. And also, like there are some people that do like um, automatic differentiation. So the problem with uh, another problem with with the mostly for people that are in the computational side is that in some cases one may want to have like a parameter parameterization of the solution of this problem, but the problem is that the, the assignment between a uh, uh, cost matrix and the R mean are the are the are the p that that maximizes uh, this minimizes this uh, cost is not differentiable, and in many cases you want to have differentiable functions because if you have differentiable functions then 
uh, there are people that have uh, created libraries, so one can automatically differentiate this expression. And because of that, uh, there's like a, a very relevant paper that uh, Matt Fukuturi uh, like five years ago, and they, in this paper, he, uh, he says like what happens if uh, instead of solving the original problem, we consider like a, a perturbation of this problem by adding an entropy term. Uh, so the original uh, transportation problem becomes how the entropy is regularized the transportation problem. And there is like one way of like thinking about this, like by by playing with how to with, like by duality, by it, one can like state this term as being part of the of the domain or the or the feasible set. And like adding this penalization basically means that we are uh, enforcing that our transportation plan is uh, close to the uniform, sorry, to, to the independent uh, transportation plan. Uh, so we have basically like the chaos divergence between our plan and the uniform, um, sorry, the independent plan, that distance is small. Uh, and the uniform... Uh, Alpha is lambda? No, they're not the same, but they're related to each other. Yeah. Uh, and so basically by, by, by adding this penalization, we are like making the transportation plan be uh, more in the interior of the polygon. And you have like a visualization here like for different values, uh, here they use the parameter epsilon, but it's the same as lambda or the inverse. But the point is that, is that if you have like a lot of like regularization or you add a lot of entropy, then the transportation plan is going to put a lot of mass uh, into uh, all the entries, but in the in the limit case, you are going to have like something that uh, is going to actually like be uh, it should only put mass in a single point. So yeah, this is something that I, I, I should talk a, a little bit more about, which is that in the discrete case, uh, the Monch and Kantorovich problems are going to coincide um, if the domains have the same uh, dimension. So I mean, if, it, if we have to transport uh, like n points or uh, on an empirical measure, uh, yeah, an empirical measure of n points and, and an empirical measure of n points, then both problems are going to coincide. And otherwise, they are not going to, there's no, not going to be a solution to the much problem because they, you, you will have to split max in a way that is unfeasible. Which one of those have more entropy? This one. Oh, yeah. And uh, a very nice thing about this, uh, this formulation or this extension or regularization is that, uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with this Sinkhorn theorem or Sinkhorn algorithm. No? Cool. That's good because like, I, I think this is a very, uh, has like a, a lot of nice properties and it's a very simple or, yeah, simple simple theorem about, about linear algebra, but which ends up being extremely helpful in this case. Uh, so it turns out that if one states the, so we want to solve this problem, um, so we can just like do the, like, use the Lagrange multipliers and state the first order condition. And if one does that, then we, we get that the solution can be expressed in this way. Uh, in terms of alpha and beta, which are going to be the Lagrange multipliers corresponding to the to the conditions that define the transportation polytope, and one can state this uh, this condition equivalently as that the we have like the, the p is the product between a diagonal matrix, and another matrix k, and another diagonal matrix, where where k is going to be given by the component wise expression <coughs> of the negative cost divided by the, by the regularization parameter. And, and one of the theorems about Sinkhorn, which like here like 50 years ago about like this kind of problems of scaling matrices, uh, says that if we have like a, a matrix, uh, there's a unique way of going for a positive matrix into a matrix that 
has fixed row uh, and and column uh, sum, and that uh, that fixed uh, that unique value has to be obtained uh, by uh, multiplying uh, pre multiplying by diagonal matrix and post multiplying by another diagonal matrix, and also the simple theorem uh, gives a re recipe like a, as a fixed point iteration of how to obtain A and B. And this uh, A and B are obtained like, by the some iterative divisions of, of rows and columns and multiplications. So at the end, like we get uh, like a, a linear algebra al al algorithm for solving this problem, uh, which is which is very nice. And <laughs> I'm actually like this, well at, at the end, like people what people have been doing, and, and I'm going to tell you about the complexity in a few moments, but. What people do now is to, instead of like solving the, the previous problem, the original <coughs> problem using a, a, a combinatorial optimization, they just apply this algorithm. Um, so there are other relations, so we can also like state connections between uh, the, the solution of the entropy regularized problem in terms of like a Bregman projection over the, over the transportation polytope. And here we have to define the Bregman divergence, which is going to be a, a matrix-wise uh, KL divergence, but I'm not going to go into details of that, but just to, just but to mention you. And also there's, there's duality relations, and we call it the, the dual formulation of this problem, and this has also like given rise to more algorithms that in, in some cases are more useful than the primal formulation of the problem. And for example, like there's a theorem that now people cite a lot by Roberto Gominetti and Jaime San Martin, in which like, they show that the actual like a, a very general statement that the this entropy regularized linear problem converts in the limit to the actual combination. So we have like convergence guarantees of the of this scheme. And also um, we have reverse mode uh, automatic differentiation, and these are. Uh, yeah, this is what I was saying a, a little bit ago, that in some cases um, we are going to have parametrizations of solutions for the for a certain of the combinatorial problem, but that solution in terms of the parameter is not going to be differentiable, uh, but we would like to have like, something that is differentiable because there are people that do computer science uh, have like libraries to, uh, to do automatic differentiation. And, and applying this entropy regularization gives you a, a recipe for being able to apply this uh, new computational method. And this is like a, a in the case of permutations, we can like a, actually like obtain like a, a nice expression for the uh, a nice approximation for the solution of a matching. So if you want to solve a matching problem with a certain parameter uh, by like Applying the same method, we can easily show that actually, like uh, the matching, or, or, or yeah, finding a matching that depends on a certain parameter, can be approximated as applying this uh, the synchron operator over uh, uh, the parameter <coughs> matrix, which at the end is a, and, and also in the case of permutation, the, the synchron operator has a very um, sim a much simpler uh, the iteration scheme is. Much simpler than in the in the in the general formulation of the transportation polytope. So here, like we get like a very uh, intuitive interpretation of, of of this property, which is like basically we, we are doing like a, a softmax for permutations. So so for example, we have like a <coughs> in the probability simplex. We usually have, I mean, we have the categories which, which are the extremes of the probability simplex. And if we uh, want to approximate the category, we, we should usually take the softmax, which is the exponential of x, divided by the sum of the exponential of x, right? Um, this uh, extension basically says that we have like a, a, a very analog, analogous relation in the case of permutations. Uh, for this operation that is the softmax, and this is given by the synchron operator, which is like a, basically doing the softmax for the rows and the columns of a matrix, and iterate that many times. 
Uh, there's also recent work on this, like mostly for people that care about like the optimization aspect and, and, and showing that the algorithms converge. Uh, there's like recent recent work showing that actually like like this this entropy regularization scheme is a good idea in the sense that, that like you can it can give you approximate solutions for the original problem by uh, I mean the cost is that you are going to get a, a, an approximate solution but what you are going to get is a speed up and they show that they they obtain so called uh, near linear, linear time uh, approximations for the for the transportation problem um, <clears throat> yeah I mean Basically, that means that they obtain this complexity, but this complexity is smaller than the, the cubic one that you. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like a very recent, interesting um, research here, also like in how to tweak the original formulation of the synchronous iteration in order to get further gains in, in computational time. Uh, for example, like there's like a recent, like really by the same guys. Same authors, like they call, they call it the greenhorn. So what they do is that they they skip some iterations according to some criteria, and by by doing that, they are able to, to reduce the, the cost uh, while not uh, sacrificing accuracy or yeah, the, the, to the the to the goodness of the approximation. And also, there are people that recently recently did uh, something called the um, over relax the synchron. Uh, yeah, over relaxed synchronous uh, algorithm, which is based on uh, or changing a little bit the Bregman divergence formulation of the problem by another formulation that uh, has like another penalty and that turns out to, to work better in practice. Okay, uh, and also I wanted to tell you about like now going more to the applications. This is something called the Bayer-Einstein Paris centers, uh, which is defined in this way. So <clears throat> given a set of measures that are going to be empirical, we want to find the, uh, and given some uh, set of lambdas to sum it one, we would like to find a point or a measure that uh, minimizes this uh, weighted sum, and uh, this is called the, the Bayer-Einstein Paris center. And this, uh, this formulation actually generalizes the displacement formula for like many uh, measures and also relates to the multi-marginal problem and so the, the transportation problem can be extended to have like transportation between uh, several measures and one can show that this is a relation uh, this is a theoretical work so I, I just wanted to, to tell you that this problem exists and I wanted to tell you like uh, an application uh, and that there is theory about this. So, <clears throat> so you can like in, in the context that people work at, it's like basically people can think or usually think as images as histograms. So you would need to have like a uh, like a barycenter of, of images, for example. Uh, so, for example, here you have you can have like a lot of zeros or a lot of ones or a, a lot of many numbers, and they are like similar to each other, but they can be translated uh, or rotated, and you would like to have something that is like a center in the sense that it's invariant to these transformations. And it turns out that the body center gives you like a, 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 a summary that is invariant to those transformations. And, but the, the computational problem is, is hard, and in some cases it's going to be non-complex, but people have like worked recently in how to make this uh, work and, and come up with algorithms that are efficient and they use entropy regularization and they are able now to, for example, here you see that the body centers between like a, a square, a circle, and rotated square. And for, you can compute this body center for different uh, values of the parameters lambda and this is what you get. So basically this is like showing that you can apply this method for interpolating data and interpolating data in a very meaningful way and that is like also computationally efficient. Uh, this, what, yeah? What is the difference between the, in the previous slide, the difference between the third and second row, the, the 
top limit. Ah, uh, yeah, this is like first iteration, save, like debug under iteration, and yeah. This is also called like fast inside PC part geodesic analysis, and I'm going to go very fast here. So, you think that uh, there's no such thing as fast inside PCA, uh, because it's hard to define, so people see like want to define some like uh, notion of dimensionality reduction in, in measures and they do it like by first like uh, uh, noticing that one can extend PCA or understand PCA in terms of like uh, uh, Riemannian geometry which in the Euclidean case in RN is going to coincide to uh, PCA and but uh, now that they have this extension they can uh, use it in the case of um, <coughs> of, of the buffer state distance in which we don't uh, have an, an, an Euclidean geometry, but still have like this geodesic geometry that I was talking a, a while ago. Uh, yeah, so like you can come up with a notion of reducing the dimensionality of measures. And this is like the, what I wanted to do. Uh, also, like another professor who went here, like worked on like uh, in the like, theoretical foundation of this method like two years ago. Uh, in showing that, like, yeah, you have an extension and and the operators are well defined and so on. <coughs> and also, like, like I'm, I'm going to go now to the applications in machine learning. So there's like a, a lot of interest now in, in, in this generative model uh, framework in which like I'm going to show you like <coughs> this. So you have like data set of high dimensional data. Uh, I mean. A data set made by a lot of high dimensional data and could be images, so images have a lot of pixels. And you would like, one would like to have a model of, of that images so that one can fit the model and then draw samples of the fitted model. And of course, like, so that those, like, draw the samples that you are drawing come from a, a, like a smooth manifold and are just not the, the empirical distribution, right? So you would like to have like a, a way of, of representing the the these uh, high dimensional data as samples from uh, from some distribution uh, parameterized uh, in a smooth way. So one way of doing this is uh, starting with a noise distribution and then apply a differential transformation. So we are going to start with a noise and then we find like the data is going to be like a differential transformation of the noise. Okay, and this, uh, usually this expansion H of theta is going to be like a equal to, yeah, they, they consider, like, I didn't want to use the word, <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's a, like, yeah, a, 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 like a composition of uh, non-linear and linear operations parameterized by some numbers theta that we want to infer, right? Yeah, so people working in artificial neural networks, they have this kind of, uh, uh, way of thinking how we're going to conceive the sampling procedure, <clears throat> and of course, like you can like using the notation, you can say that, that the the measure that you are producing is going to be the push forward through this function h on the original noise distribution. Um, people recently have uh, uh, have realized that actually, like using the passage side distance. Uh, it's a very sensible idea for addressing this problem. So you, here you have like a, a, a beta, which is going to be like a, a data set, and you want to find like the, the, the parameters, beta, so that they match the, the data better. And, and people have been using the, the basis and the discrepancy, and this is going to have very nice property, and it's going to lead to, to, to to algorithms that in practice were better than alternatives. Uh, here, for example, we it would be very hard to use just MLE, the maximum likelihood estimator, because like we if we use MLE, for example, we would we it would be hard to get a, a the density for this transformation. So, but by doing this, we we can apply all that we had before, like the duality relations, and and differentiate and get. Um, Algorithms that work uh, for this problem. 
uh, yeah, also in this program, people have been using uh, entropy regularization. So, I mean, entropy regularization is something that is pervading all the applications of uh, optical transportation, and I think it's like the, the main idea in, in the computational side. And also, like, the, like this kind of, uh, in, in these applications, there have appeared some theoretical questions from the result that people have been uh, seeing in, 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 in practice. So <clears throat> here, like, uh, for example, in, in a paper, people show that using the bus say one distance uh, works very well. But uh, one may try to use another notion of, of discrepancy between distributions, and actually, like, with other notions of discrepancy between distributions, uh, one is still uh, should be able to obtain tractable algorithms. Uh, for example, like there is uh, like a, this uh, energy uh, energy discrepancy between two measures that is defined in this way, and we have also the total variation distance, and we, we could also like apply this. Uh, discrepancy and come up with algorithms and actually like we also have like a um, duality relation so for the case of the energy distance we can ex maybe I'm missing a, a two here but we, we can also like express it as a as a difference between two integrals which is the, the same as for the basis cell one because of the Kantorovic's truance theorem like it could be the same expression but we just change the, the set of functions uh, as the Lipschitz one, while here we have like a, a, a ball in some Hilbert space. Uh, but the thing is that still, like, even if we have like different notions of discrepancy, the passage time one distance appears to be working better than the uh, alternatives, and, and people have been like wondering why is it the case that the passage time distance is working better than the others. And for example, there's like something, uh, quite odd, which is that the passage type distance has a very bad properties in terms of sampling complexity. And here by sampling complexity means that in practice we uh, we don't work with the actual passage type distance, but we work we work with, we work with sample uh, estimates, right? Uh, we, we, the passage type distance is an expectation, but we work with samples from that expectation and the algorithms work with samples with these expectations. And the problem is that like, we should need to have a control of like, how this sampling approaches the actual uh, expectation. And in the case of the, the basis state distance, like, this is uh, very bad. So like, if you increase the, the dimension of the data, like, you will need to have a lot of samples to convert to the actual expectation based on, on, on your sampling estimate. While for, for the case of the energy distance, for example, that is much better. But uh, still, the basis of what this basis say what this was work better. So the question is like why this uh, distance work better than the other? And for example, this is a paper uh, that was released three weeks ago that tries to address this problem uh, theoretically, and it, it is related to to study like the different like uh, geodesics that are entailed by this definition. Um, basically, the claim that they make that at the end they don't show. They cannot show anything because, because like, uh, it ends up being a hard problem, but they, sh they kind of suggest that the, the, the type of geometry entailed the pass by the passage size um, distance is uh, more suited for the kind of parametrizations given by, by this kind of, of, <coughs> of uh, parametrization of the, of the sampling as taking a noise distribution and then taking a, a nonlinear function. So from the from the side of like having new theoretical questions, this is like a, a very interesting one. Like why one some distance work better than others? Like we have like many ways of of, of measuring the distance between distributions, but it seems that the passage time has like a very special role here. And also like in people like I I, I think like this sounds may sound futuristic, but it seems that in some in the future it can be like a real problem. So th this is related to the adversarial examples and the adversarial attacks. 
So what happens is that people usually like train uh, neural networks to learn to identify objects from others. Uh, and people have shown that actually like it is very easy, easy to, to hack these, uh, these technologies or these systems. For example, here they, you have like a, a banana and this is that is classified, you, you train a neural network and in this state class, classified as a banana. But if you put a sticker, then uh, it's, it's, with, with very high probability it's not, not going to be classified as a banana but as anything else. So, and, and this like um, leads to the question of like how do can we design systems that are robust to this? Uh, and what people have been doing like very recently is to well, I mean the, the problem of, of robustness like, have been uh, have a long time of development uh, in the past like all the people that were doing like uh, working with uh, the statistical learning theory of the PC dimension theory all, all of them like were addressing this kind of question but now people have also like proposed like a a, a renewed uh, formulation for the robustness problem which is that, that instead of like minimizing a loss function uh, we want to minimize like a, a robust version of the loss function <coughs> which in this case is going to be given by the supremum of the expectation uh, with all the with the distribution taking in a ball in of some metric and people have, have like uh, worked recently like what happens if we choose a faster time ball and we try to train a model like in, that is robust in the sense that it is minimizing this function that people have obtained like a, a derived algorithm for minimizing this robust loss and um, also they have they have obtained like theoretical guarantees that this is like better than don't do it uh, so like there are like two like uh, lines of more theoretical research that arise from this uh, technological uh, issue uh, yeah, um, I think that this is like the, um, the that's the slide that referred to very recent stuff. And that's it. Questions? Um, I'd like to better understand the um, entropic regularization. So that, and the regularization term alpha or lambda. Mm -hmm. So first I'd like to know if in practice you choose it by hand or as in, as in Bayesian inference, so you can have a, a, like a ver very basic least worst um, um, regression where you have that term and you just add it because you want the solution to be regular. But if you do a Bayesian formulation, that term uh, uh, appears naturally from the choice of the prior. And in that case, that parameter has a, has a meaning, a very clear meaning. Is there any way of reinterpret this uh, entropic regularization so that that parameter makes sense and you can choose it? Yeah, I, I thought about that too. Um, for example, also like when you do switch regression or the lasso, you have this interpretation that you are adding like a, a prior. Yeah, and I would like to think that also if we are adding a prior in some sense, but I still haven't, I, I mean, I haven't seen any paper in which people attach like a Bayesian interpretation to this procedure more than just doing uh, like a regularization. But maybe there is, but I don't know. And if you think of the one part four, which measures as a dynamic problem, I think there's interpretation is, uh, is related to, to considering a Ronian motion, which uh, is conditioned to have these two uh, marginals at the, at the beginning and at the end. So it's related to the variance of that. Uh, are in that direction. So you are, you, you are saying that you are changing the covariance structure of the cost? In any case, the random motion is extraordinary. I mean, it's really a way to smooth the problems, a dynamic way of smoothing the problems, but it's very, I mean, I think you get something of that kind. Mm -hmm. It's related to the Schrodinger problem. Yeah, yeah, actually, like, people, like, cite a lot that, like, entropy regularization, like, traces back to a paper by Schrodinger in the 30s. But uh, that paper is in German, so I don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Ye
Sí, ¿Le puedo preguntar? So the the whole so the whole selling point of uh, OT is that you can compare distributions that are supported on different domains. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then all the results that we're seeing in machine learning they are ba based on the Wasserstein time distance that assumes the same domain. So I wanted to go back to the different domain thing and ask you if uh, you have seen uh, OT to compare different models. So for example, again, in Bayesian inference, you have models of different orders. So you have two posteriors supported on, uh, say, RN and RM, uh, and you could compare it with OT. Is there any word on that? I haven't seen anything. So, what I guess, like, if you...